Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to a brand new episode of Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Today, we will examine the First Amendment of the United States and the importance of the free press, not just in our country, but across the globe. Without free press, governments cannot have checks and balances. The press becomes a propaganda mouthpiece for whomever is in power and the state and at the federal levels. Censorship, unjust persecution and execution of journalists, human rights defenders, writers, bloggers, and other peaceful critics and those who dare to have dissenting viewpoints contrary to the views of a government in power will become the new normal. Take, for example, the news that we have just heard from Saudi Arabian Kingdom special press a few hours ago today about journalist Jamal Khashoggi's murder inside the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul, which was described as an incident. Finally, no more denials from the Saudi Arabian Kingdom about the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi inside the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul. Now, if we can only just keep it real and not continue to make lies about the reasons why Jamal Khashoggi was murdered, their country press release account of what happened is not just unbelievable, but insulting. Jamal Khashoggi was killed because he got into a fist fight with an undertified uh, Saudi nationals inside the consulate? Seriously? One six-year-old man decides to take on 18 older guys in a fist fight. Yeah, that happens all the time, right? Oh, and the Saudi Arabian government deeply regrets this incident fired two of their top murders, uh, I mean, employees, the royal court advisor Saud al Katani and deputy intelligence chief Ahmed Asiri. And there is more. Saudi King Salman pledged to restructure the kingdom's intelligence services after Hashogi's killing under the supervision of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And they praised the Turkish government for doing their investigative work? Really? Meanwhile, the White House acknowledged in a statement that Saudi announcement on the investigation of Khashoggi's death. Quote, we are deeply saddened to hear confirmation of Ms. Hashoggi's, Mr. Khashoggi's death, and we offer our deepest condolences to his family, fiancé, and friends. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said in a statement, right, I think that his family, fiancé, and the world would be happier if the U.S. Congress imposes stern sanctions on Saudi Arabia, since our rogue president will not compromise his probable business connects in Saudi Arabia. Anyway, on that note, we're lucky to have Kerry Vacho, a local criminal defense attorney and journalist with us. And Kerry is a former correspondent with the Oregon Journal, uh, Tiger Times, uh, Hillsborough, and Anchorage Daily Newspaper in Alaska. Ooh. I cannot think of a better person to have this chit chat with today. Welcome aboard again. Well, thank you, Bia. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So, um, where to begin? Let's talk well, about. Um, I think, as a journalist, you know, you before you became a, mm -hmm. a, a criminal defense attorney, you worked as a journalist. And uh, let's talk about the First Amendment uh, in the United States and what that meant and means to you as a professional and to so many journalists around the country and around the globe? Well, I think to a lot of journalists and persons in our country, the First Amendment is just, it's, it's almost sacred to us. Because it was the First Amendment done by the Founding Fathers and it was adopted in 1791. Um, it was an interesting time period because freedom of the press has been an issue before in our history. Uh, in fact, when John Adams was president, uh, the, the Federalists were had a, enacted laws that it would make it a crime to criticize Congress or the president. And Thomas Jefferson, who was vice president at the time, was very upset about that as well. And as a result of pushing back against central control and authoritarian tendency to have a, you know, a, a centralized government, the, the 10 Bill of, right, um, Bill of Rights were passed by Congress and adopted in our country. And uh, freedom of the press, freedom of the speech, freedom of religion are all incorporated. And freedom to gather and protest and petition to government were adopted by our country in 1791. It's been tested. 
but there's been a number of, of great decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court, including, I'm thinking of, you know, our sports figures that uh, are protesting and, and raising consciousness to, you know, what's happening in our country by standing and not, uh, you know, crossing or, or kneeling down when the national anthem is done. And back in uh, 1989, we had the flag burning cases, you know, it, uh, that happened and went up to U.S. Supreme Court case. And former Justice William Brennan had one of the great quotes about the First Amendment. And that, if I might just read that to oh, you please. briefly, it says, if there's a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea offensive or disagreeable. I, mean, I find that quite interesting because uh, I think the uh, First Amendment does sometimes get misconstrued, yep. especially by hate groups. Yep. So we have uh, the outright groups that says we have the First Amendment right to protest. But I don't think, not to the account, uh, expense of uh, sharing hatred and targeting right. certain groups. You, you have a First Amendment right to express yourself, to write, to petition the government. You don't have the First Amendment right to incite or to cause violence or to have child pornography or, um, you know, things of that nature is not protected. But uh, certainly the right to, you know, express yourself no matter what your opinion is. And there's a history in the, the constitutional law that more expression, whether it's, you know, you agree with it or not, or whether it's, you know, true or not, or fake news, is not to be suppressed, but in the, in the idea being is in, in the um, expression of many ideas, the truth will prevail. And so there's a number of times that, uh, whether in World War I, we had the Sedition Acts, which had to be visited by the courts and, and pushed back, but there's a number of cases through the years that have uh, protected the rights of minority groups or people who want to express an opinion that is not in the majority view, which is really relevant today when we have Trump, our president, you know, attacking journalists at rallies. As a matter of fact, yesterday at a, at a rally, I think in Montana, he was praising the representative there for having body slammed a reporter for merely asking a question. I mean, this is really scary times that we're living in for free expression and, and, and stuff, and we need to push back on that. And that representative, that's a crime. That was an assault that he had to plead guilty to. But we have a president that is, you know, fixated on being, you know, uh, more authoritarian. And that's why I think Jamal uh, Khashoggi's case, which you were talking about in the entry, is, is, is very, you know, actually horrific, but he also was a major proponent of, of you, know, you know, free expression. In fact, the Washington Post, one of the great newspapers in our country, whose motto is now, you know, democracy dies in darkness, just published his last opinion, editorial, editorial yeah. opinion piece, in which mm -hmm. he talks what the Arab world needs most is free expression. Right. And one of the quotes in here is, which uh, Jamal wrote is, a, is where he's talking about almost all the Arabic nations are not free to have free expression. And he's saying as a result of not being able to have free expression, Arabs living in these countries are either uninformed or misinformed. They are unable to adequately address, much less publicly discuss, matters that affect the region and their day-to-day -day lives. A state-run narrative dominates the public psyche, and while many do not believe it, a large majority of the population falls a victim to this false narrative. Sadly, this situation is unlikely to change, particularly when we have a crown prince that is murdering journalists. Yeah. You know, who and not taking responsibility that. for it. Exactly. Because uh, until yesterday, there has been adamant denials that uh, this had happened yeah. inside the Saudi Arabian consulate. Um, and I think it's shocking that our own government, which ought to be, you know, promoting the value of life, is instead, you know, worried about money from the Arabic world and is, you know, pushing the lives of journalists and free expression under the rug. Well, and that really, I think, is going to be the testament for our democracy mm -hmm. in 2018 and beyond is, well, is $420 billion uh, worth of negotiations with Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. uh, justifiable? you know, in terms of looking the other way and buying into this you know, bogus excuses that we were fed uh, by the Saudi Arabian press today, yeah. 
about the account of what happened with uh, journalist Jamal uh, Khashoggi, you know, it's just beyond me because uh, we're dealing with this problem right here in the United States right now, where people who are trying to bring news, real news, and have dissent mm -hmm. feelings and thoughts about a current government are, you know, shamed, disrespected, uh, put down, bullied by our, you know, president, and nothing happens. And mm -hmm. we already have the trend across the globe with authoritarian governments of what they do with people of the press or who are free thinkers, you know, who dare to share their dissent publicly or exchange ideas with other constituents. And so yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think what Jamal also was talking about is in his own original country, there's hundreds of people have just disappeared. I mean, they, they've been locked up, they've been in prison, they've been killed, and uh, they may not have had the, the stature of Jamal, who was an American, lived in Virginia, and had a residency here. Um, but we're trying to struggle and get out information in their own country. In fact, this, ed this opinion piece is really good because he talks about there had been hope at one time that with the use of the Internet that, you know, individuals in places like Saudi Arabia that are autocratic regimes would be able to express themselves. But as he points out in his article, the, these autocratic regimes have cracked down and are suppressed the ability for, you know, citizens or residents of Saudi Arabia or other uh, countries to even access or be able to get out information. In fact, I I'm, I'm recently was hearing about what's going on in Brazil, you know, where we have, apparently, uh, Bonsario, I think, is running for president on a dictatorship, autocrat faces. What's going to happen to what's left of democracy in Brazil? What's going to happen to the journalists? What's going to happen to the Amazon forest? Are you even going to get news about that if, if someone like that comes to power on a, who's publicly advocating overthrowing the Brazilian Congress, overthrowing the democracy? democracy? And and the government as it is structured right now, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. But, uh, you know, yeah. what we do know that we've lived under a military dictatorship for 21 years. Actually, I was born into that dictatorship regime. Oh, wow. And I remember uh, one of my earliest member memories of childhood were the ones of how you are um, coached by your parents mm -hmm. about censorship. Uh -huh. Where walls, for example, a classic in my house is like wall has ears. So you have to watch out what you say, where do you say, and whom you say it to. Well, particularly in this era of technology and, where you can and, bug homes. You know, the news uh, were censored. There were mm -hmm. people from the military government that actually read the uh, program scripts prior to being uh, aired. Uh, same with newspapers. So uh, the news were really controlled. Mm -hmm. And those who had any dissent feelings and thoughts about the government will, you know, pay the visit by the military government. Uh, well, that's pretty scary. And uh, they will just come over and pick up these individuals and torture them. Uh, the level of torture was just unbelievable. Like right now, you have a lot of um, survivors mm -hmm. or children of survivors who actually witness their parents oh being uh, tortured, mm. speaking about the horrors of that type of regime, to, to remind people nowadays that, that is that really the best for uh, Brazil's democracy mm -hmm. and country to have this kind of authoritarian and, and you know, barbaric regime? Now, right. It's just like going backwards, yeah. not forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it, it really is painful to, to see that and to see that from 85 to 2018, uh, those who survived that regime either got complacent about it or having selective amnesia, but mm -hmm. the youth, those who not at a place to remember, you know, what really happened, because they were not even born or very young, they don't understand how bad it was. Right. Well, it was like Voltaire once said, you know, once you give up your freedom, you don't get it back yeah. without a heavy price. And I'm fearful that's what's going to happen in Brazil. And, and it's shocking what happened to Jamal. I mean, he was dismembered. <laughs> I mean, think if you're a journalist, would you, trying to write articles, if you know that the 
government in power could kill you. I mean, that's because that's a silence. Let's take a quick okay. break and get right back on this, all Sounds right? Sounds good. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on ThinkTech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us, where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantamo, and I'm here with uh, Kerry Vachu. And Thank we're you. talking about freedom of the press and the importance of defending it as our life depends on it, which it does, mm -hmm. as we are clearly seeing countries where that is not respected and protected, what is happening to their society, to the people, mm -hmm. and to those who really uh, choose you know, this field, and, and it, 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 we, well, we were just talking about what would it mean for someone to work under these, uh, you know, challenges and circumstances. Well, when I you can know. see a lot of reporters, I mean, who wants to get killed and dismembered? I mean, if you have a family and children and everything, it, it's, it's the one heck of a tool to suppress any kind of free expression of anything. I mean, look what happened in was it 2011 when there was some hope that they called the Arabic Spring, you know, that there'd be free press, and then the Egyptian uh, military junta came to power and just suppressed it. And, uh, there's hardly any news coming out of there from the free press, you know, and they, it's not like they can go to another Arabic country either because mm -hmm. it's all, you know, authoritarian. And I think before the show you were mentioning that in Africa there's been some issues going Yes, on. actually today I got an urgent alert from Amnesty International mentioning okay. that uh, local journalists and civil society activists have re started receiving death threats and their family also being threatened uh, since October 10th. Mm -hmm. And that was because of the monitoring poll stations and publishing live municipal election results in uh, South Africa, uh, specifically in Akala, Porto, and Nampula cities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, I mean, like, you were a reporter and you covered um, legislative news. Can you mm -hmm. imagine uh, covering some election or a bill process that didn't go right and or receiving a death threat? Or a press on, on, yeah. on uh, corruption within our elected officials. Right. And there was a famous case, actually, I stumbled on it earlier. I hadn't heard of it. It was back in 1735. They prosecuted, in our country, before the First Amendment was even adopted, this publisher who was critical of politicians. They ended up throwing him in jail, and it caused a, a, a lawsuit. And, and it, that was one of the early cases that eventually led to our own First Amendment. Um, but it's, a, you know, then to have a president that's uh, currently, you know, trying to shame and call fake news and, and stop investigative journalism. And, and in fact, I just saw on the Today that they're, they're prosecuting a couple of leakers of information from, I forget which part, the State Department or what are the departments to stop information from getting out. I think all of us as citizens ought to be really concerned about this. We're lucky we're in the United States so, so far, but. So far. You know, but, and we're lucky we have an independent judiciary so far, and we're lucky that we have a constitution, which many of these countries really don't have, and we're lucky that after the Civil War, you know, we adopted the 14th Amendment, which among other things applied the federal law to the states, so the states have to respect the First Amendment uh, as a result of that, uh, those decisions being made. But uh, we, we are very lucky, and that's why I brought up the Brazil one, because Brazilian uh, politics that's happening because that's really scary because a country can lose its freedoms. You know, really quickly. And really quickly if we're not careful. And, and 
Yeah, like on guard. And even think about North Korea. I mm -hmm. know for a fact that there, uh, people don't even know what Facebook is, WhatsApp, uh, Twitter. Right. They don't have Snapchat. access to that. <laughs> uh, if you have access to the internet, it is very limited, and the government monitors it. Mm -hmm. All of the news um, on TV and radio stations uh, revere you know, their leader mm -hmm. and their government and their 70 years of reign there. Mm -hmm. So people don't know any different. And even those who do, they, they, they cannot express it because they will be prosecuted and they will be killed. Yeah, and or thrown I, in prison. I can't imagine living in a world where, you know, you it's like fear. that, you live in fear. Yeah. Like I am, totally re-triggered and um, upset, you know, with what has happened in Jamal's case, mm -hmm. because uh, this is happening all over the world, uh, you know, for so many decades now. And I think part of what's happened to him, the, the audacity of a government to say, we're going to ambush a Saudi national and an American prominent U.S. resident mm -hmm. inside a Saudi consulate and kill Which him like there. Usually been yeah. sacred ground and not take protection. responsibility for it, right. and uh, threat even to uh, have consequences to countries who will, you know, take a, a position, you know, against what's happening mm -hmm. or demand for more transparent investigation. But I don't think that this would happen in 2018, have the United States not treated Saudi Arabia as allies and back them up the way we do now. Yeah, I agree. And so I do hope that more people um, catch up with history and with what's going on and uh, have more discussions, and if they're too confused or unaware about what is at stake, that, you know, they seek other right. sources, you know, to be able well, to get... and we've always, our country's always been a leader of, of, of defending, you know, rights and free expression, and this is a classic example, not to pander to, you know, murder, but to and create our own propaganda to try and cover it up, but rather, we, you know, I would like us to see and join the UN in condemning uh, this barbaric atrocity, you mm -hmm. know, and stand up for, you know, our country's always tried to do what's right. You know, right. we've failed at times, but we try to do what's right and be a moral beacon for the world. But we, it's like we've given that up right now. But, uh, we're, but our country does have a constitution, and the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment really does mean something. But it has to have the support of everybody, you know. Do you ever wonder why we don't have protests and more people out there, you know, in front of the Congress demanding for accountability and for a stronger position of our government? Well, we've had right in the now. past. I mean, I can during oh, the Vietnam War. I know about the War. past, but like now, 2018, <laughs> yeah. why do you think that, you know, we have this kind of apathy? I mean, people mm -hmm. are cooking inside, but, you know, and they are sharing their, you know, frustration online mm -hmm. or with their family or loved ones. But why is it that we're not together, gathered and say, this has got to stop? Well, maybe for a lot of us, it hasn't come home personally like it did for Jamal and his family or his, you know, his, the wife he wanted to marry. Um, or maybe, um, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I know that we had a lot of strains up with the United States court proceedings with Kavanaugh, but uh, I don't know if that's going to last or not. Well, are we that divorced uh, from the illusion that this is so far remote, remote or removed from what could happen to us in our own society, in our own lives, in this country, that we just pretend that it's never going to happen? I don't think, I don't think most, I think, I think this whole thing with Jamal is going to have to take some time to di get digested into our consciousness as a nation. And I think that 
whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green, these are common issues to be able to express ourselves that are vital no matter what your polit political persuasion is. And uh, we've always been a country that, under the courts, have promoted tolerance for different viewpoints. And I think if it, I think if more people, not just journalists, but more people come to see that, that this is under attack by our own current administration, that hopefully, be a, hopefully there will be um, pushback. There will be more people that will join together in, in arms because it's a civil rights issue as well. And, uh, What's a human the right issue? Human you know, right one issue. of the arguments that I heard a lot at the beginning of this investigation with uh, General Shamal uh, Khashoggi was, well, he was not an American citizen. That doesn't matter. Who cares, exactly? Right. He was a human being. He was a human and being. It wouldn't matter if he was not even you know, a resident of our country. It doesn't matter. He's a human being, and that's where our values should be, in my opinion. Exactly. And so yeah. I think that uh, part of uh, doing our work here at Think Tech, for example, mm -hmm. or being able to even write a commentary you know, in any news article that we can read across the country is important so that people can practice uh, civic engagement, mm -hmm. uh, they can exchange more information uh, and hold uh, governments accountable. But it's not just the government that I'm frustrated with right mm -hmm. now. It's really about um, a call, I think, for every citizen to be able to take their responsibility. I mean, it is a privilege to be able to vote, to be able to mm -hmm. speak out your mind, you know, freely and without fear of... Without fear of censorship, yeah. being able to write. Exactly. Or, or without fear of being killed, you know, exactly. in a fist fight and right. dismembered right after that, you know, with a, a bone saw. That's you know. why I'm as, as pleased, like, you know, as, uh, I mean, there really are advocates, and it's not, you know, including the Washington Post, for example, they translated Jamal's opinion pieces into Arabic languages so that mm -hmm. people back then tried to get it out on the internet. So, despite right. autocrat societies trying and governments trying to shut it down, hopefully his message gets back to, you know, the people he grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I can't believe 30 minutes went neither. by so quickly. <laughs> but thank you so much for you, uh, being here and. Yeah. Uh, sharing your perspectives with our viewers and um, and sharing history with us. You know, uh, those who don't know their history are bound to repeat the same mistakes. Yeah, I used to have a history professor that yeah. said that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I, I hope you can come back and Thank I you. hope uh, you can to. continue to use your skills as a, you know, journalist, as a trained mm -hmm. journalist to continue to engage uh, people in our community and anywhere you have a chance so that we can have you know, a freer and respectful and yeah. uh, dignified society for all of us. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Bia. Yeah. Well, this concludes uh, our episode of Perspectives on Global Justice. Uh, thank you so much, our viewers, for watching us. And until next time, we hope.